Hey everyone, Pete Calandra here. This is review video for class 10 of the Audio MIDI 2 course I'm teaching in the fall of 2021 at the Copeland School of Music, Queens College, City University of New York. This is the second half of the class. The first half of the class I show some videos that I made talking about mic positioning and treating your room to get a good sound. If you'd like to see that material, there'll be a link in the description box below. The video I'm presenting here goes into some detailed aspects of mixing. I'll use three tracks from three different albums of mine to demonstrate a bunch of different mixing techniques. There'll be chapters in the description box below so that you can navigate and see all these things at your own pace. If you like this video, give a thumbs up. For more content, please subscribe, and to be notified, ring that bell. Please leave any comments or questions down below. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much for watching, and let's get right into it. I have three tracks in three different styles, and I'm just gonna go through these mixes with you. Now, realize that some of these mixes were done six or seven years ago, and some of the techniques that I'm teaching you now are things that I've developed over the past six or seven years, but other things are still applicable for you to learn from. So this is another pretty big session. There's probably about 40 something instruments in here and it's uh, a choir piece with orchestral instruments. And um, let's just take a look at how I've got this set up. So you'll notice that there are a lot of there's some tempo changes. I start out at 56, up to 62, down to 58. Then I've got time signature changes. And I've got all my markers here. Now, I've gone over this before, the memory locations, right? Now, memory locations are really good because they enable you to navigate between different sections of your piece. So, right, I've zoomed way in. Actually, let me do this. Let me get the big the big counter up. Great, and let me make this, put this in the middle here. I'm just setting this up so I can zoom in so it's easier for you to all to see. So, memory locations, let's uh, let me set up this microphone, this camera. Okay, so with memory locations, you notice that over here, right, there's a number. So this helps you to navigate to different sections. So for example, if I wanted to go to the open, which is measure one, I would tap on my keyboard here decimal point one decimal point you see I'm at measure one if I did decimal point seven decimal point I'm at measure 42 which is verse two if I wanted to go to the B section I would do decimal point four decimal point so this is a great way to navigate around your session really quickly by using memory locations and why is that essential because if I'm mixing and I want to just listen to different sections of the piece to just get the relative volume. I want to jump around and make sure that like one section is not five times louder than another section. I can do that. So I can do something like, let's go decimal point for decimal point and I'll be playing it. And now I'll go to a different section. Verse two, outro, open. Okay, that's soft, but that'll get bit louder. Uh, choir enters. Right, so you could see that I can quickly navigate back and forth throughout the timeline, and markers help you do that, and you can get an overall you get really quick feedback. Wow, that section was really soft compared to the other section. Do I really want it to be that soft? Or maybe I want to adjust it, right? So it gives you a really good way to jump around the section and check your levels and really to just see your mix in a different light. Okay, so let me play this track and then I won't play the whole thing, but I'll break it down for you. 
This is from my album Carpe Noctum, and it's called On Use Day. That's enough of that. So, there's not a lot of treatment with this piece, right? Because the sounds are all are all pretty good. But let's take a look under the hood a little bit. You can see that this track here. English uh, English horn right you could see that there is volume automation and notice how subtle it is there's not a lot of it there but if you look at the waveform right what the goal here is to the when the player has their dynamics that they're playing there's a timbral difference between a softer note and a louder note that's just not volume. The instrument also sounds different. So in a mix like this, you want to make sure that this, you could see that this area here is softer than this area here. So it's brought out a little bit more. And just this tiny little subtle difference. This is, whoops, excuse me. Give me one second here. That's minus 2 dB. And that's minus 0.6 dB. So like one and a half dB difference of volume makes a difference in the way that. Right? And so let's listen to that little section with the rest of the orchestra. Right? It makes this note audible. So if, let's say I did this. Um, for right now, let me just delete that. Right, it gets covered over a little bit, right? And this is where you have to work to develop the sensitivity in your ears to hear the difference between that and this. So what I do is when we're in this section here, I'm listening to the choir. There's a men's choir going, ah, uh, let's see if I can find that, and then I will solo that. Let's see. Yeah, okay. So right here, if I get rid of this, when we get to this point, you'll hear that the men, and this is the focal point, this is the melodic content, right? That's the other point that I want to get here, is that when you're mixing, you have to understand what the focal point of your mix is, and that would be the melody. And then you, you know, the, the, 
the thing that you want to understand is that the melody should be what's the most audible and then develop the sensitivity to note the difference between how loud the melody is compared to how loud the accompany is accompaniment is so you know if the melody is this loud and the accompaniment is this loud then you're listening to a broadway show if you know but if it's right you, you just need to understand the difference and and make that blend so for here this is a good blend right now between the choir Now, if I get rid of the automation here, right, on this note here, it's very subtle, but the choir takes over the, the importance because it becomes in the front. So just tiny little subtle changes like that may, can make a big difference when they all add up. You are future camera. Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I'm just testing to see if you're paying attention. No, I'm only kidding, my friends. <laughs> so let's take a listen now to this, this right here. So right here, you see that in this area here, there's a dip in the volume because the waveform is really big and it was jumping out in the mix. So let's let's listen to this with everything. So let's just focus in on this area here. All right, so I'm going to I'm going to loop this. And it'll just play over and over again and then I'll delete and put back the 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 volume automation. See that how that sticks out? See, it comes back just a little bit, right? You bring the volume down just a little bit there and those high notes don't stick out so much. They become part of a nice integrated mix. So, right here, this let's solo this. Okay, so I wanted that to fade in a little bit, so let's get rid of that and listen to it. And listen to it in context. I wanted it to sneak in, so I just helped it out a little bit with this. And then, right, so check out this right here. That almost sounds, this whole part almost sounds like it's at one volume, even though you hear the timbre changing and getting more bright as they're playing harder. And then that doesn't take over the mix as much. Let me get rid of that. No, 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 Mr. Cello, softer, right? So, um, yeah. And you can also, you know, bring out the volume. Just making that a little louder and then helping so that it's, you can, it's audible.
And you notice here, right, there's a lot of clip-based gain here, right, plus 8, plus 7.9, plus 15, you know. This was recorded very quietly, so I had to add a lot of clip-based gain to get it so that... Let's do this um, so that you can see. So this is at the end of the chain. Right, so I am going higher here, but this is mastered. So if I turn off all the mastering, So the peaks just get a little bit above minus six. Right, so this is quiet and this is living around minus 16. And then when you put all the mastering stuff back in, you can go above it. So basically why I want you to mix to minus six is that at the end of the day, somebody could master your music and they will have room to play with. Okay, so let's see. Is there anything else from this one that I wanted to show you? You know, um, that sounds real, right? Would you guys all agree that that sounds pretty real? Like the choir is all sampled. Let's let's take a listen to this. It's insane, right? I did a lot of programming work, but this I'm just going to solo the choir. And the way that I got that to sound real, aside from the fact that the samples are great, is that I did a lot of work with dynamics uh, in the MIDI. In MIDI, you know, I I drew in stuff, I played stuff in, I worked it, and it has the, the program has something called a word builder where you can string syllables together. And this one was a Latin, um, a Latin word builder. So that's how I could get the Agnus Dei, Agnus Dei. When I was in choir with Dr. White um, in Rat House Hall, which some of you haven't been to college, that's where the music department used to be. We used to walk around saying to each other, have an Agnus Dei, Agnus Dei, instead of have a nice day. Had to sing a lot of stuff in Latin. Okay, so that's what I wanted to show you on this particular track. Let's go to another track. And notice how I've got my all my Submasters here. And I only have one reverb track. Everything's going through that. It sounds fine. And I did not have to do any much processing over here because it was recorded, even though it was soft, I, I did a really good job with mixing in MIDI. And then when I imported it into as audio, you know, I had to do some some other work to get the volume all right. But, you know, this was recorded you know, it, it just, everything was basically done well. It didn't need a lot of post-treatment. Oh, one other thing I wanted to show you. Right, so. You know what? I'll show you this on another track, similar thing. So let's close this out and do not save. 
Any questions on that, right? So you got that, that like subtle volume changes can really help smooth your mix out and you have to develop the sensitivity of your ear to hear that stuff. And you can just draw that in and effectuate it that way. Again, I've got, you know, my memory locations. Now, if you want to see this little window, right? Um, if you go here and it says memory locations, you can see that little window. And then what I typically do is I usually keep my memory locations open and I put it on my second monitor, which is my third monitor, which is over on the right hand side of the, it's over there and I can see it. Um, and then the key command is the command and the number five on your numeric keypad. Yeah, on your numeric keypad. So this is a different style of music. Let's take a listen to this. Okay, so let's break this down a little bit. So this is, you know, a, a very meditative, uh, uh, a very meditative piece. It's hypnotic, and it sort of builds up gently as it goes along, and it's smooth. I don't want any instrument to stand out too much, right? I don't want there to be huge dynamic uh, swells. I just want it to be nice and smooth and peaceful. And um, let's take, so I've got my drums here. Let's take a listen to those. So I've got this really low kick. I don't know if you can hear this. And then I've got these brushed kungas. And they're very quiet overhead drums. Yeah, they come in like right here. So that's almost like a heartbeat, the bass drum there. And that goes really well with... And then I, let's look at some processing, right? So with the bass drum...
I'm just exaggerating a little bit of this, but I'm cutting right here, getting rid of the woof. Boom, boom, right? That boom. Right here, that's taken out. And just adding a little bit up here to make it a little bit more defined. And then there's also, this is a compressor. It's too hard to explain, but I'm just, you know, keeping the dynamic levels a little tight with that one. That's got a lot of confusing controls on it, right? <laughs> I like things simpler, but I did use this on this one because it added a certain color to it. Yeah, and then with the brush kungas, remember I talked about adding some distortion occasionally? That's the sound. That's with a little bit of saturation. This is actually something called Soft Tube Saturation Knob. This is a free plugin that you can get from Soft Tube, and it works with Pro Tools. Um, yeah, I would go look for it. So it's S O F T U B E, and it's the Saturation Knob, and it's definitely free. And Pro Tools used to give it away when you got a subscription to Pro Tools. I don't know why they don't now, but this is a great plugin. It's very simple to use. It's got, you know, basically a one knob and a little switch. And let's see if I really turn that up. It not only makes it louder, it makes it fatter. Right, just makes it a little bit more energetic. So if I've got the drums playing, and we'll play it from here. And I've got the drums all going through a plate reverb, right? And that's that really high, nice, pretty. If I just, let's do this, let's solo the snare. You can hear that really pretty high reverb there on the snare, so that works really well. <clears throat> and then for the bass on this, I played this using my Mini Moog, which is in the back there. Um, Yeah, it's in the back corner, that brown one that's on top of the, that uh, uh, shelf unit. And it's just got a huge sound, right? But I'm adding even more bass to it with this. And then just this, what this does is just add some more saturation. And then this just cuts off the very, very low frequency. So let me bypass these. And then I'll add them back in. With the bass drum. See how you can hear both of them, even though there's a lot of low information. And then, um, I've got the acoustic guitar here and let's uh, solo the guitar. So I've got two tracks of guitar. They're both playing the same thing, this one, which is in the left. And then I recorded a second time in the right and it's spread very far apart, and that gives you a nice wash with the drums and the bass. Right, the drums are in the center, the bass is in the center, and the guitars are very wide, and that's giving you your rhythmic flow. Right, that's the function of that. And let's look at the processing on the acoustic guitar. So this is with no processing. It sounds fine. This is that little guitar I um, played in the living room in my Martin, and this is using the that little 184 mic that I, I've shown you. 
So the first thing I did here was to cut some of the low frequency and to boost around 4,000. So that gives us a little, on, on a guitar, between three and 5,000 is the shimmery part of the guitar. And so you can just add a touch and it makes it a little bit more sparkly, but don't overdo it because it can become really harsh very quickly. And then this is just a compressor. And all the stuff I'm doing with these fancy plugins, you can do a really good job with the ones that you have in your, in your kit. It's the concept. And now the other thing I do is I use this thing called center and I reduce the sound that's in the center and that's of this, even though it's two separate guitars and it makes it seem like it's coming from outside of the speakers, which gives you even more room. So I'll, let me bypass this and then I'll exaggerate it. So what, when I turn this on, you'll hear that the sound gets less bass in it. Right, so that's the sound that's in the center. So it's sort of getting rid of that, which lets it cut through a little bit more. So it's getting rid of the low end and it gives you this sort of sense that it's spread wide. And then there's an electric piano. So I've got that going through an echo hall and a delay. So let's just see, see what that's doing down here. So, oh, the echo, echo hall, that's this. So I'll turn that off. Right. Very dry. Boom, bop, boom, bop. It's sort of adding that rhythm, right? And let me just show you. You can do this again with the kinds of things that we've got. This is my delay line right here. I've got a, 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 an echo. I've got a filter on the echo. And then I've got something that does a panning with the echo. And then I've got reverb at the end of the echo. And that whole chain is what makes up that sound. So let's do this. Let's go back and let's see. So this, let's see. So I'm gonna turn this way up. So this is about 17. So I'll turn this way up. Oh, it's automated. Let, let me turn it up here. So I'll just start adding these all back in one at a time. That's the delay. The filter. Tremolo. And then a reverb. And you get this beautiful ambience with some added rhythm. And then you play that with the acoustic guitar right here. Now, when you're doing this kind of work, what you have to realize is that everything kind of fits together like a glove, right? So if my guitars are doing that strummy thing, my keyboard doesn't need to be all busy on a track like this. It can be soft, just holding out those chords and creating an ambience and having that additional rhythm from the um, uh, that's coming in from the echoes, right? So this is just, you know, partially mixing and partially you're composing and mixing as you're composing, you know? Now, 
right? The guitar is taking up the guitar is taking up a certain area in the frequency range, right? And the strings are way above that. I don't need to have they're just playing single note line. I don't need to have, you know, two octaves, three octaves of strings because that would get in the way of the guitar. The guitar is strumming in the mid register and the strings are really high, right? And then there's this pad here that's sort of between pitch-wise where the guitar and the strings are. So that fills up that whole space. Each one of those in instruments has its individual function. So part of what I'm trying to establish here is that when you're composing, you should be thinking about the function and how it's going to fit into a mix. Where is it? What kind of rhythmic job is it doing? What kind? What pitch register is it in? Who is it playing with? Right? And is it getting in the way of that other instrument? And this is sort of where writing in something like Sibelius or Finale fails you because you're not really thinking about how something is going to be mixed, right? So with this writing inside of a DAW, you're getting that feedback right away and you can affect that stuff as you're writing. So that's another compositional concept that aids in your mixing, right? When you're writing, you should be thinking about how it's going to fit into the mix. So the function of what you're playing, the pitch register of what you're playing, how rhythmic it is, who it's complementing, who it's supporting, who it's um, doubling and creating a, a unique timbre. So for example, what do I mean by that? Let's take a look at this pad here. Let's see. So that's a sound. Now, do you see how that works with the strings? They work together to create an aggregate sound. And the one, one sound is the bottom part of that, and the other sound is the top part of that. So that's built into the composing. And it makes it easier to mix. Same thing here, right? I changed the pad sound. You see how it fits like a glove with the piano. It's like a glove with the guitars. Right? I'm not going crazy with my left hand. And it fits in with the bass. Again, the point here being that the tracks that you create as you're creating these, recording these things, try to keep in mind function, where it fits inside the soundscape. Is it a complementary sound to the melody? Is it creating an aggregate texture with another sound or two? Like what I said before, the aggregate texture, right? That would be the pad here with the strings. That's one texture made up of two different instruments. Right, and then that fits with this Wurlitzer's in there too, the electric piano. And you can barely hear it, but it's there. It just gives a little attack 
right? So let me show you, right? This creates the aggregate sound. So this is right here, just a solid, just a chord with the echo right on the downbeats, right? And that just gives a little point to the downbeats. Again, so all of those work in comp complementary to create an aggregate sound, the three of those together. And it was composed that way. And, you know, that's a big part of mixing is, is, the, is composing with that in mind. All right, let's move. On. Any questions on this, right? I, I, I tried to make that point clear to you um, with this, but hopefully it'll stick in. <laughs> I, I do have one question. Yes, sir. Um, it, it seems like a lot of the, the work that we do with the MIDI tracks, um, is, there's a lot of overlap with that and mixing. Uh, I know we should be mixing with the uh, committed audio tracks, but I guess no, what no, should no, we no, still be doing no, with... No, no, you're mixing as you're working. And the, as the better your MIDI mix is, the better your audio mix will be. So when do we know when we're ready to commit those tracks then? And then yeah, when do we do that? yes. When do you know? That's the sixty-four thousand dollar question, right? You have to be happy with the way it sounds, and then, um, like, remember yesterday, Andy, in in uh, class, in the film scoring class, so that the the piece that had the drum, the rhythm to it that I played for you, uh, the the library, the cue that I extracted from the demo suite, right? I got that sounding really good in MIDI. I rendered all those as stems. And then once that the stems were done, um, I decided to change the arrangement and I was able to edit the stems together, right? So there's still work to be done afterwards, but um, you can do things like clean up rhythm a little bit easier with audio files. Uh, I've showed that, I've shown that before. Um, I don't know if there's a, I could tell you a, an exact time, but when you feel like you can't get something much better like there there becomes a law of diminishing returns so for example let's see if i can relate this with another subject so you know you can spend ten thousand dollars on an acoustic guitar and then you could spend two thousand dollars on an acoustic guitar and then you could spend two hundred dollars on an acoustic guitar right the difference between two hundred and two thousand is so much greater than the difference between 2,000 and 10,000, right? There's a, a law of diminishing returns where you can keep on working on the MIDI mix and you're not really getting it that much better. So you have to develop that sensitivity. I don't think that there's much, I haven't heard any issues with your mixes. Your mixes sound really good. Um, so I think that you do intuitively understand that. But the, just it just is better to have everything rendered as uh, audio and at, at the end of the day. Like with this, there's some there's live tracks in here and there's synthesizer tracks that I played and there's MIDI tracks in here. Well, I might, I'm might i on a different computer. I might not have some of those MIDI libraries anymore. So if I tried to open this up, I might not be able to open it, but it's all audio tracks so I can open it. I didn't have uh, one of the reverbs that I was using when I got my new computer. It's not uh, compatible with Catalina uh, Lexicon, my Lexicon reverb. So I use a fab filter. So I had to replace some of those, but that was an easy fix. So anyway, I hope that helps. Yep. Thank you. Okay. So what I want to show you with this um, track, this started out its life as a, a film cue. And then I reworked it. I should have. I should have that linked instead of going looking for it. Um, this was a PSA um, for abused children, and the soundtrack was really dark. And then I made it a little less dark, uh, and I released it on an album. I reworked it, and I get this is on Sirius XM Spa Channel uh, fairly often, a few times, a couple, two, three times a week. It's it's played, and it's been played since 2015 so it's still in rotation six years later um, and then this somebody has this on a playlist this particular track and I get about two or three thousand spins a month on Spotify somebody a 
friend of mine, Karen Beal. Uh, she's really good with playlisting. I should actually have her come in and talk to the class about doing that. That's a good idea. Let me let me rem write that down so I don't forget it. Give me one second. I'll text myself. <laughs> So let's take a listen to this. It's very simple, right? It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven tracks. So the reason what I want to show you here is how you can just have a few tracks and create a cogent piece of work. It doesn't have to be 500 tracks, right? This is very spacious and ambient. Okay, I'm going to stop this here. And did you hear? Um, no worries, Salida, I got that. Um, did you hear how, much, how long that reverb lasted? Right? Interesting. But it works. I, I don't recommend you guys starting off with reverb that long. Now, one reason why I'm playing, there's a couple of reasons why I'm playing this. Reason number one, not a lot of tracks. Reason number two, I know a lot of you are MAP students and you're not in the music department, but a good portion of you are graduate students. And, you know, as trained musicians, right, we always are educated about technical proficiency, lots of notes, you know, we're wowed by Coltrane playing five sheets of sound, uh, 
by Horowitz playing octaves faster than anybody ever did. We're, we're awed by technical gymnastics, Maynard Ferguson hitting a note above the you know the human hearing range or something on his trumpet. You know, we're we're we appreciate that because we we spent many hours working on our craft, learning how to play our instruments. But that's not always the most expressive kind of music. So one thing that I think everybody needs to learn how to do is to be able to write simply and still have a, a compelling piece of music with the least amount of notes possible. That's a good skill, especially if you want to become a media composer because I've found through much trial and error, a hundred films worth, that sometimes leaving a space is a better option. I have this uh, story that I worked on a film in 2010, in the fall of 2010, called Rise 1961. And it was a documentary about, uh, a sports documentary about the Nineteen um, six, the U.S. skating figure skating team, and they had uh, the Americans were like dominant in figure skating in the Olympics, and then in 1960, that was the last run of a certain group of skaters, and then they've got had a bunch of new skaters come in that had like four years to get ready to p compete in the Olympics, right? And so they get aboard a plane on, on February 11th of 1961, and they're flying to Europe. And um, the plane crashed, and everybody on the plane died uh, at Idlewild Airport. You've never heard of Idlewild Airport, but that was the name of the airport, Kennedy Airport, before it became Kennedy Airport. It was called Idlewild. And... Uh, in 2011 was the 50 year anniversary. So what happened after this tragic event, which, you know, was, uh, I was too young to really be aware of something like that, although I was alive in 1961, um, was that they started a fund, which then grew more skaters. And then by 1968, you had Peggy Fleming, like who was like a childhood crush of mine. She won the gold medal in the Olympics and she was an incredible skater. And then you had, you know, Scott Hamilton and Brian Boitano and Michelle Kwan. They all came out of the, the fund that was started and the rebuilding effort. And they wanted to pay tribute to these people and get more money for the funds. So they put together this big documentary and it was a, uh, um, it was an amazing experience because the, I don't know what it's called now, but there's this big theater on West 44th Street where the Minskoff, where the Lion King is playing. There's a big movie theater. It used to be called the Astor Theater. And I used to see movies in there in the 1980s and 90s. And uh, like in between shows, I'd go in a matinee, I'd, I'd head over and I'd, it was this huge theater, like maybe say like 1,200 people. Big theater with like three aisles and uh, really old and then it got changed into a performance space and then at in 2011 it was called the Best Buy Theater and then it became the Nokia Theater so they rented out this theater and there were like 1,500 people in this theater and then it was simulcast across like 550 theaters across America it was called a, a Fathom is the company that does this and it was called a Fathom event and they did a whole presentation before the before the film with um all the people that were the storytellers in the film and my friends who were the filmmakers, they were all like up front and they were being interviewed. They were having a conversation. Then they showed the 90 minute film. And then afterwards there were more questions and answers. And it was just, it was an amazing experience. So the, um, the upshot is that there was this moment where the plane crashed and they flashed to the, funerals and the graveyard and I've got this really somber music going and then they showed tombstone 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 right they showed four tombstones actually as a tangential 
side uh, story, all the coaches died too. And there was this one woman, I can't think of her name right now, but she was an amazing coach up in Boston and her daughter was an up and coming star and she died and her sister died. So like a whole family got wiped out, right? It was really tragic. So anyway, you've got these four cuts to these graves and uh, tombstones and I had hit each one perfectly with a chime, right? The music was suspending and it would stop and then ching, 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 ching and it was really chilling. And then we were we were at the um, final mix down and um, of the music, and the filmmaker asked me if I could mute the chimes there. And then all of a sudden, it goes to silence, and it's so much better, right? So much more poignant because all the music before it became so much more emotional because there was this space and you could absorb the sound and. As people who are trained musicians, or even those of you that are not just MAP students, right? You, you always think about like technical proficiency and all this stuff. Well, it's more about telling a story in sound and whatever method you can do to get that story told is the best thing to do. So a track like this that I played, I played this for you to show you just how to make a spacious, simplistic, well, simple, but not simplistic, piece of music that leaves a lot of space and you fill in that space and that's helped out by some of the treatments and that's what I'm going to show you right now so let's just take a look at the piano right uh, sorry So I'll take the treatment off the piano. You know, that's nothing, right? I mean, it's a, it's a nice, simple piano figure. But once you start adding the treatment, it, it starts to take on a meaning because the treatment adds a, like additional music to the piano part. So I left space in the piano part so that the effects can take over and create additional music. And that additional music, while being basically just a repeat of the piano part, has a different timbre to it. So it's all because I've done some you know, effects, uh, playing around with the effects. So it becomes almost like another instrument answering. And it becomes, and I went over this in film scoring class yesterday, it becomes canonically contrapuntal. In other words, it's like a row, 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 row your boat round. You play the part and the part is playing and then the part plays again while the and it keeps on playing and there's all this overlapping and all this additional music. Well, if the p part that I played on the piano was incredibly busy, that would sound like mud. But because I've made it so that there's a lot of space in the piano part, the ambience and the texture can fill in. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to mute the piano part and I'm going to do something called, um, I'm going to send it pre. So now we'll hear just the, this, the reverb. So it's a big reverb, but the other thing about the reverb is that it's, it's got like a chorusing effect on it. You can hear it go wah, wah, wah. I'm exaggerating, but you can hear it almost vibrating pitch wise. Right? And then let's listen to the delay. Do I have the delay not solo saved? Oh, it's muted. And pre. Here we go. What? That's a strange sound, right? So what am I doing here? So this is like a fancy chorus, right? We have chorus 
in our uh, in the air. If you've got the air music technology, it has air chorus. You could do the same thing with this, very similar. And then I've got this delay that's doing this tapped ping pong at quarter notes. And this is you can I could easily have done this with um, the mod mod delay, but I I I happen to like that plugin. And notice, right? Watch when this plays right here. This is when the sound starts. Listen to how long until the delay comes in. So this note actually sounds right here. This note here sounds right here. And that by itself is ugly, but when you add the plate reverb, uh, the, the pla this other reverb, Wah, 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 right? That all gets tossed together to create this really incredible ambience. And then if we add the piano back in, and we turn the pre off. Now, the other thing I want to show you is another aggregate sound. So right here, I've got this uh, sound called soft glass, right? And it's a low, right? And then I've got this pad sound. I created this from that white white synth in the back there, the Oberheim Two Voice Pro, and then these together, and then I've got these strings, so you see that? That's one sound made up of three components, and then there are these bells that also play at the same time. right and another aggregate sound they double right the piano and I'll take it off and play the piano just it just adds that tiny little texture and I don't have it all the way through the piano part Right, I only have it in a few spots. So, when you're creating your composition this way, all these subtle little things, these things that you can do inside of a, a Pro Tools, a Logic, a Cubase, Ableton, Reaper, all any of those DAWs, you can do all this stuff that's really beautiful and learning some of these techniques like creating aggregate sounds by stacking complementary and sounds together or accenting a certain figure like for example right here on the piano right accenting that bottom that sound is really weird on its own. But it makes almost like a, a very haunt, like it adds another level of, of etherealness to the piano track. So, all right. So I think that that's quite a bit for today. <laughs> quite a bit for today. jam-packed. You're getting your money's worth. <laughs> any questions on any of this? I think this is a good place to stop for today. No? You guys all good? You can write me a 2,000 word essay on what we went over in class and have it in tomorrow? Just kidding. <laughs> all right. You know, Okay, thank you, Caitlin. Um, 
just one thing seriously uh, some of you are missing assignments so I'm gonna send a list you pro probably possibly have handed them in if you could just let me know which one what ones you've handed in I'll go look for them and do feedback I'll have time this week since both of my classes don't have assignment due till next week um, Caitlin if I don't get you that back by the weekend send me an email to remind me and uh, yeah and uh, so do your best over the, to get something done just you know I want you to get used to rec starting to record audio and adding it with MIDI get your you know I, I don't know if you've started but it's always good to have a last week when I was doing the acoustic guitar thing I was having a little trouble playing it because aside from not being a good guitar player it'd be nicer to have if I had a drum or something to play against instead of just a click track right so that's always a little helpful is maybe if you've got some sort of reference play to that also helps be careful though that your headphones are n not blasting so loud that the sound from your headphones is r really audible in the microphone you're gonna get a little bit of microphone bleed a uh, headphone bleed no matter what you do but th there comes a point where it becomes really obvious so you just have to be careful for that okay with that being said and um, Great. Uh, I've got nothing else to say today. I will catch you guys next week. Have a great week, rest of your week and great weekend. And uh, thanks so much for being here today. And some of the questions I got were good. And hopefully this opened your eyes to a few things because um, you know, I'm constantly learning more stuff about this. So don't ever think it stops. <laughs> it never stops. You know, it's just like learning an instrument. It never stops. Yeah, and that's what keeps you interested. Have a great night, everyone, and I'll catch you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thank you.